Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We are have been talking about uh, 1971 war. 50 years have gone past and we are still talking about it because obviously a lot of new people either they join the forces and they want to know the history and those who haven't joined the forces still want to know as Indians what India did 50 years back. As also the world would want to know because South Asia is increasingly became, becoming more significant. So as a result, how things have panned out over period of time, the world has a perception about India. The world has perception about the Indian Defense Forces. They understand that a war was fought where 93,000 prisoners were taken and a nation was born through liberation called Bangladesh. But what went through was greatly perceived in a particular way by the Western world and by the adversaries, squarely, I'm talking about Pakistan and China. And today, as we talk about the industrial age, 4.0, it actually is information age. People are glued on to media. And we saw when the Gulf War came in, it was largely called a media war. Why was it called a media war? Was nothing happening on the ground? Whatever was happening on the ground, was only known to, to the people because television had come in. And <coughs> the number of war correspondents, the television channels, and also the Americans wanted this war to be seen. And their perception was not only about what the Americans are doing, but also what the American equipment, military, hardware is capable of doing. So as a result, media became the next big thing in war. And the war shifted from the actual war, which was territorial in nature, which had political objectives, which had military means and objectives to be achieved, but also largely became a war of perception. Media shapes the perception. So there are two ways of looking at it. Media reports whatever is happening, credible or whatever perception they want people to have about the actual events. A victory can be seen or made to look like a defeat and a defeat can be made to look like victory. It depends on how like a, you know, loyalty of fighting a case. So as a result, this powerful tool today, in today's age, can actually decide on the outcomes. And even if you go to the Security Council, I suppose it is all perception which has been thrown around. And based on the perceptions, decisions are taken. Based on the perceptions, we have uh, the global groupings coming in together to side one uh, party or the other and take decisions. The weapons of mass destruction became a big affair when a case was being built up to attack Iran. Whether weapons of mass destruction were found or not was another matter altogether. But that was less reported that they were not found. Yet to justify a war and to demonstrate the success of war, the media came in a big way. So today I have a very distinguished panel sitting here with me and they need no introduction. Sir Mark Telly on my left has been the head of the BBC from uh, 1964 in India and he had a career of uh, 30 years as, as BBC A reporter and then he became the head. And next to him, is Vishnu from TV Network, uh, Nine, TV Nine Network, uh, who has also been in BBC for 12 years. And on my right side is Subrata Chattopadhyay. Uh, he actually is an enthusiast. He is into perception. He makes films, he interviews people. He's running Brains Trust. He also has Peninsula Studio. So largely into perception. Rather than talking about only what media did and what media can do, let's today talk about what media is actually meant to be doing and what media lands up doing. Sometimes they are bidding, sometimes you know, you spoke, uh, you heard about uh, Christine Fair saying that there are people who have paid the lobbies to build perceptions in America and the Congress takes a decision. So I'm not going there, but it can happen that the decisions can be based on what the think tanks talk about and what media actually communicates to the uh, 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 
people at large. So I will first go to Subrata Chattopadhyay to say that you have been a watcher, you are an enthusiast, you are into perception. And I think by interviewing so many people, you have made certain perception and observation of national security events, but at the moment we're talking about 1975 war. So I will request you to first talk about the power of media and how you used it and how you think media being a tool to shape the future of a country and the perception of the world. So, Brother Chakra. So, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, the, the three, four people in the audience who I'd like to thank. I'd first like to thank Jal Kardozo. I'd like to thank Admiral Arup Singh. I'd like to thank Sport Leader Rana Chena. And I was deeply inspired by Sandeep Pandithan when he launched his book on uh, the Bangladesh war. So what we have done is because of these officers who fought the war, they have told their story. They were either battalion commanders or they were uh, company commanders in the 1971 war. They have told their story. I have to tell you that I discovered Bangladesh war at my age. I did not know about it. And since I'm in the US, I have to mention that it is one of the most fascinating wars and one of the most decisive victories any military anywhere in the world had got ever. And my worry is, and I was talking to Sandeep outside, that he, he made a mention to General B.K. Sharma that this program should have actually happened in a college or a school anywhere in India because people should know what happened. And we are blessed with such fine minds in the military. And if you, if you were to hear their story, it's very important that this story is told. We are talking about the lessons and so on. Never in the history has it happened that a military has walked in, done its job, and fallen back. Uh, if I have your permission, we have a little video. It's about the speakers and what they say. May I have the permission of playing? OK. So if Rishabh can play the video, and then I'll sort of be silent. Vishal? seminal book, Just and Unjust Wars. And he goes on to say that it is 20th century's most outstanding example of humanitarian intervention. Okay, in um, 1969, I achieved my schoolboy dream of becoming an aircraft carrier pilot. So I landed on the deck of Highness Vikram um, and um, I was just beginning to settle down on the ship when I received orders from naval headquarters that I was going to the Indian Air Force on exchange posting. And then I was posted to a squadron, which is number 20 squadron. So the balloon did go up on the 3rd of December, as you all know. Our squadron flew one, two, eight sorties, which represents 140 hours and 35 minutes in seven days. <coughs> you must remember for us, the war was from the 4th to the 11th. So at that time, the battalion was engaged in uh, in operating together with our uh, Mukti Bahini colleagues in uh, across the border, and we were literally, you know, wearing lungis and operating with our uh, friends uh, from the Mukti Bahini. It was quite a unique experience in that sense, and I make this point because uh, I think those operations which were conducted before the actual outbreak of war were very significant in in context to the fact that first they brought the Mukti Bahini and us very close to them. Now the operation, just to give you a broader view of the operation, 4 Corps was the one which was operating in the south and southeast. The 4 Corps was commanded by General Sagan Singh. Southwest the thrust was led by two corps, 
which was commanded by General Tapi Rayana, who later on became the chief of the army staff. And from the north, from the Siliguri corridor, was 33 Corps under General Thakur, who later on was the vice chief of the army staff. The fourth corps sector provided the shortest approach to Dhaka. This was only 80 kilometers from Agarthala. Four core tasks was to liberate all Bangladesh territory east of Bin Laden. The core was also tasked to cut off the road and drain them to Chittagong, which is the most important port in Bangladesh. Most of the military supplies coming from Pakistan and abroad came through Chittagong. Four corps had three divisions to carry out the task. Eight mountain division was in the north, 57 mountain division in the center, and 23 infantry division was in the south. See, the Navy's overall concept of operation centered on taking the offensive on both the seas, west as well as the east. The capstone strategy in the east, which was the focus of the entire war, was to seek action, destroy the enemy in his ports. Strangle Pakistan Army's supply lines to Chittagong, Cox's Bazar, and the Charna Pulna Mongola River port complex. Now, the first target that we had on the 4th of December was to attack air attack on Cox's Bazar, where there was an airfield <coughs> and some aircraft parked there. Soon after that, the main target actually was Chittagong Harbour. Chittagong Harbour was the main port, Chittagong was the main port and it had all the infrastructure that a good city would have. And so we launched that night, third night, we launched the last <laughs> cooking attack in modern military history. That night when we reached the objective, the call of Ayur Gurkhani polarized the enemy defenses and in the moonlight, the cookies chopped off, many heads, many heads rolled. And we would take these troops like that, in formation of three helicopters, and land at that uh, NZ, at uh, landing ground at uh, Silet. When the uh, main dam bridge was blown, our core commander, as I mentioned earlier, was on the, I won't say on the horns of a dilemma, he was at a wide edge. He could have taken one of two options. First was, he had done his task, he reached the river line, and he would allow the whole army then to mobilize and get to a position which he did not to do. He was not one of those guys who was willing to not see beyond what was required to be done. It is his estimation that the bridge having been blown up and the adversary not even stirring out of his defenses, this was the time to move beyond. And in the moving of beyond, the only obstacle was the danger. One way to cross the danger was to use the helicopter lift, which had earlier even been selected. What does Sagar do? He gets hold of his Air Force commander, Chandan Singh, and asks him whether a battalion could get across on helicopters. Chandan's answer is yes. I remember somebody mentioning, sir, what will happen to ground fire? And Chandan Singh's response was, I will be in the first helicopter. That, that question ended there. He gets to me and says, Chami, what about your tanks? I said, sir, I'll give it a try. When you have a commander who is as strong, as willing, as capable, no matter what order he gives you in battle, your answer has to be a yes, sir. I consider my duty before beginning my account to dedicate it to the true heroes of this glorious victory. They are the brave and magnificent helicopter pilots and their flying machines. It is they who made victory in war and liberation of Bangladesh possible in an unimaginably short time. It is also dedicated to the freedom fighters of Bangladesh who risked their all to join in the freedom struggle. Representing the spirit of them all 
is the lady whose photograph you see. She joined us at Meghna. Along with her children, braving all odds, she came to greet us with a gun in one hand and in the other a pot of cooked rice. History knows if few, if any examples better than her, of courage under adversity, who in spite of all inhuman suffering inflicted on her kind, did not hesitate to answer the call of her motherland and eventually emerge triumphant. It is her that I name Meghna, the goddess of victory. My salutations to her and my former friends and comrades in arms. Jai Hind, Joy Bangla. Um, objective. The other thing was we would never 
show anything like any action anymore. It will have to be deferred. So we'll record stuff, keep it with ourselves, and then after a lapse of a few minutes, maybe even 30 minutes, we'll go out and we should say that this is not I mean, broadcast live. This is what we received some time ago. So that there was a lapse of time between what had, had happened and we were showing it. So there was no danger of people monitoring and then taking evasive or uh, responsive actions on the, on the basis of that. Again, uh, electronic media especially has a habit to run to relatives, families, and start asking questions uh, that agitate them. We were requested not to do that, and even if we recorded those people, to again defer it and not, not in plain passions. And uh, you see, uh, when a reporter reports or a debate is happening, party debates these days, there's a loop that goes on, which is basically archival. Sometimes that can agitate in plain passions. So uh, we were requested not to do it, if possible. If it was absolutely essential, then you had to put the word file photographs or archives very, very prominently so that people know it otherwise. So media became responsible after okay. this. Itself. So, so what you're talking about the contemporary media in India, or maybe BBC, you know, you've been with BBC for a uh, Very short comment on how do you feel to have some of the recent text? Oh my God. <laughs> I uh, went to BBC when Mark was already in Delhi reporting. He was uh, he was uh, no well known all over the world and obviously in India. And uh, when I went to BBC, people asked me if I knew Mark. I said I know Mark. I have never met him, but I've heard him a lot. Because when I was growing up, when seventy one happened, I was all of eleven years old. And uh, I don't know why it happened, but I was given the responsibility every day in the uh, school assembly to tell people what had happened during the war in the last 24 hours, which I would cull from newspapers and from Mark's uh, reports that we had in BBC. And uh, I was given 10 minutes every day in the assembly, and I would actually narrate to the assembly what had happened in the last 24 hours. For me, it was like a cricket match. I was giving out the numbers of uh, fighters who had been shot down, what the the, the, the the progress that the army had made. So I, I became a second-hand reporter actually at that age. But uh, things like names like Nat, the Giants, never did say home. They are etched in my mind since then. So going to BBC was great. I mean, my father wanted me to uh, qualify for civil services, which I didn't. So when I got selected for BBC World Service, he was very happy. He said, Chalo, Indian Administrative Service when you are World Service in Okay, thank you, Vishnu. I turn to Subrato. Uh, again, actually, uh, uh, I'm referring to Subhaktari. You go and interview people and you form your perception. If you are to interview Subhaktari and extract from him in one minute that as what you do in making very short films, what would be your most powerful question to Subhaktari? I think very few people, uh, he's lived in India all his life, but very few people have a deep balanced insight into what has happened in India. And he has a great historical sense in a very balanced manner. I have read much of what he's written. So it would, I would certainly, it would be a great honor and a privilege that he were to get that out of him. Because there are very few people who have, in a very balanced manner, seen what's happened in India over the last Okay, so thank you. If I were to frame a question for Sir Mark Teddy, a short question because I would want you, uh, sir, to talk about it in your language, what you feel about your being in India. Um, around 30 years of your association with BBC in India, of course, you were not always here and you would give those reasons. That you actually saw external emergency of 1971. And you also saw internal emergency. And if you were to form your impressions about your experience in India, and we are talking about the war of 1971, which was a watershed moment, yeah. I would want you to actually come out today to say, what does your heart say of your being and a British living in India as an Indian with an Indian heart and the Western world, how you were being controlled, were you being tutored, or you stood independent reporter 
as an independent agency in India. Your comments, please. Well, General Sari, uh, set a huge agenda. But I think the first thing I would like to say is this, and that is that um, uh, we have an issue here. Um, the BBC is a very large organization. Um, the uh, a, a person like uh, me is only the front of the BBC. I get all the glory, which is very unfair, because I remember time and time again uh, the work that the Hindi service, for instance, uh, did back in London, the help that they gave, the mistakes that they stopped me making. Um, I remember vividly when Narasi Murad became Prime Minister, and Narasi Murad had personally told me that he was ill and he was not going to contest the election. So I said on the air that Narasi Murad is not even a member of Parliament. Uh, and I got a very rapid kick in the pants from the Hindi service, who said he is, he's a member of the uh, uh, Raja Sabha. So um, uh, uh, I think it's very important that uh, I don't get a big head or swollen head, and that I make it absolutely clear that the uh, BBC, uh, I have been made by the BBC. The BBC has not been led by me. Um, on, the, uh, on the question of uh, the sensitive war in particular and what we were aiming to do, um, we were aiming, as we always do, uh, to provide balanced coverage. But it's very difficult to do that um, because uh, for one reason, uh, we were not getting real uh, reports from the, uh, from the Pakistan side of what was happening in Bangladesh. Here, I must mention people who uh, never get the credit they should do. We were getting reports uh, from our stringers. Um, that is the local, re re local reporters. And I can tell you in any story um, which I have worked on in India, I have been always assisted uh, without any um, without any doubt uh, the story would not have been complete without the assistance of a local reporter who were working for us three months. And the tragedy of the Bangladesh war, well, one of the tragedies Bangladesh war was that uh, uh, a stringer of ours called Liz Amadine was uh, brutally shot, uh, murdered, um, executed, used whatever they like, with the other intellectuals in Bangladesh. And he was chosen um, because of what he uh, reported for the BBC. And now, I'd just like to add one other point about perception. In a war, particularly, the perception um, on the, uh, of what the BBC is reporting, basically, is, in, to a large measure, the public perception, uh, influenced, actually, um, by whether the BBC is uh, sending news that, that that country wants to hear um, or whether the story is going against that country. I remember, you know, when I went into East Pakistan as it was after the Pakistani army had moved out of the barracks and the atrocities had started, uh, I was told that in order to be balanced I had to go to um, West Pakistan. When I was in East Pakistan, um, uh, Bangladesh is, uh, or East Pakistan is as they were, were treating me like a, a hero. When I got into West Pakistan, I was uh, 
shown uh, in the office in the uh, by Radio Pakistan. I have shown the various uh, pseudonyms which were given to the BBC in West Pakistan because the story was going against them. One of the sort of pseudonyms, if uh, you will forget, is forgive me, is a very military pseudonym. We were called the British Bullshit Corporation. <laughs> we the British Papuas Corporation. Um, and other such pseudonyms like that. So when you, the public perception, and that's what I'm trying to say, is influenced by whether the public likes the story or not. Um, and I think that's a very important point. And we used to have, I remember I was told this, because it happened just after um, I uh, joined, the, just before I joined the BBC, the 1965 war. Um, well, we took some pride apparently in that, well not pride, reassurance in the fact that we were getting criticisms from both the Pakistani and the Indian government. And we saw that as evidence of our, our balance. But I must stress, and I'm sure Vishnu will verify their this In 30 years working for the BBC, I have never once been told by bosses or editors, you must take such and such a line. I have always been told, you must try or you must retain balance as well as you can. So, you know, a very interesting description you've uh, given. I would not go by the other titles that people attributed to the BBC. But I would say that there is a war of perception and there is perception of war. There are perceptions of war when you speak the truth and people will perceive the way they want to perceive. But when you want to fight a war of perception, then you could be working on a narrative. So very difficult for people to understand if you're working on a narrative or you are speaking the truth. So I think it is a credibility of any news agency which would make people actually believe. Now, Jerry Cardozo was sitting in front of me. He was a young painter at that time, just come back from Staff College. And from Adgram, where he was talking about in the video shown by Subroto, the last Kukri attack in the modern warfare. They were heavy lifted. And troops were being heavy lifted in a manner that Pakistanis could perceive whatever they had to perceive. Ultimately, they tuned on to the BBC. And then they get the information that there is a brigade which has landed up there. Nobody knew how much has landed up there. Only uh, General Cardozo at that time, Major Cardozo and his battalion commander knew how many troops have landed up there. I don't know. I mean, my perception is you call them, you know, Gurkha Brigade. So it could be, you know, that perception also. But I don't know how the BBC was taken as that you're building a perception of war by truthful reporting. Or according to how this was reported on page 79 of the book, which has been written by Daniel Cardozo, he talks about the Beats broadcast, what turned the tide in favor of the Indian uh, Army. I know that this morning we, we spoke about it and we also uh, went through a chapter a bit. So, what I'm saying is, that if it was so much of the other name that you gave, which I don't want to really say because it's, it's the organization which I am not going to be really talking in this way or that way. But imagine the credibility that BBC had, and you said the Pakistanis did not like the BBC, but yet they believed your information and actually took and made a war plan. So I, I think you, you deserve that kind of a compliment for this kind of credibility. And I don't know whether the reporters created credibility or it is the government behind the BBC organization or the governments behind those who are running the media houses. Um, so, any, any comments on that? Well, well I, I would simply say it's the BBC. Um, uh, the BBC is, is not a government organization in any sense, uh, except that the government uh, grants a charter to it. Um, and fixes the rate of the writing. The government fixes the rate of the license. That's, that's all. Um, so um, it is, as far as the 
credibility of the BBC goes. Um, uh, what happened by the Bangladesh war was uh, so much the BBC's war in a way was because um, uh, it came at a time when there was no television and when the transistor radio revolution had taken place. So radio listening had spread very widely, uh, there was no television and importantly um, the, uh, the only local or national broadcasting which was taking place on either side taking place for, uh, through All India Radio or Radio Pakistan and both All India Radio and Radio Pakistan although they had some brilliant people in them, uh, many of them my friends, uh, they were um, uh, forced to broadcast what the government told them to broadcast and this is a very stupid policy because the Indians and Pakistanis are very intelligent people and they know perfectly well what is government propaganda and what is news. So we got this huge news thing and we got people turning to us because the state broadcasting was so bad. And why why did people choose to listen to BBC rather than Voice of America or um, Deutsche Welle or anyone like that? Well, I think one of the fundamental reasons, certainly why they turned to us rather than VOA, was because VOA was a government broadcasting organization. Um, and I suppose uh, another reason why people uh, turn to the BBC, but this is only a guess, uh, is because, of course, uh, people associated uh, uh, the, because of the historic link. Britain and uh, um, India, but um, uh, that, uh, I, uh, that I think was the basis of the credibility of, of the of listenership of the BBC. And I, I'm going to just add one thing, and I'm not blowing my own trumpet, I'm blowing the BBC's trumpet. Um, uh, you know, uh, Okay, we were credible, but in a sense, we have we would not have retained that leadership if people have not believed in us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, much think, I wish you would say something. You see, I just have one thing. Yes, yes. Uh, when we get into the UK, obviously, when Mark uh, went there, it was different. When I went there in 1992, uh, the BBC is training the best people for everything. And while uh, Mark said that some, some, some countries like what they hear about, they have spoken in, in, by BBC. But we are, uh, in BBC, you are taught to report facts and analysis based only on those facts. They do not like, we have these days, take a stand, an ideological stand. When you were broadcast. So, so you are talking about the independence of, of the agency. Yes. And, and therefore, along with that comes the credibility which got established. Well, when the reporting is wrong or right, it is completely left to a person uh, who's perception. reporting his perception and his observation. So, it is, it is not the BBC at large, but whatever information comes, it's very difficult. Yesterday we were talking about intelligence. Uh, 40 to 50 percent intelligence is seen as good intelligence to actually going to war and take uh, decisions about war. So I suppose even reporters uh, have to have to receive information and I think they are also under time constraint because it goes into broadcast rather than into a, a, you know, a group of few in a, in a tight chamber. Uh, so I think it's a great responsibility. I'll come to Subroto. That brain's trust uh, sits together with the British High Commission. Um, since you know, BBC says that you know, they have been extremely independent, therefore the credibility. You have, along with Brains Trust and British High Commission, I think they have just let you to do your stuff. And you have gone and interviewed a lot of war veterans of 1971 war. Uh, tell me, what is the impression that you get about 71 war and about the Indian Armed Forces uh, after you have interviewed them? Uh, just give me one or two 
quick perception because I'm actually going to close the discussion here, running out of time, but very quick one or two uh, interventions. Well, I have to say two things. One is that it's been a great experience talking to these officers. Without exception, they are big men with large hearts. One. Without exception, they acknowledge the, the, the contribution of the Mukti Bani. All of them. In each of the episodes, there is evidence that they're there on record saying that without the Mukti Bani, we wouldn't have been able to do it. The third thing is that the Indian military is fruitful. There is a 650 page record of the Indian Navy written by Bill Bilananda. Now, I don't exactly remember the number of pages, but there are about 60 odd pages on the Ghazi. The Indian Navy says that we did not sing the Ghazi. And it's a brilliant, I mean, if you give it a slow read, there are interviews and reports by many officers. So what, what I feel good as an Indian and I'm a civilian is that I have tremendous faith in the Indian military. It's a fantastic organization. I plan, I'm a civilian. These officers have been most kind to have agreed to do these episodes. We will take it to universities, schools, and the Indian corporate. Indian the people who, who run the Indian economy should know that they are able to do it because of the Indian military. They don't know. They don't know where where Agartala is. They don't know where Chamla and Chittagong is. They need to understand, and they also need to understand the Bangladeshis are our friends. So this, you know, it's it's it's, 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 it's a fantastic country, and so I think that's the way I look at it. For me, it's it's it's. it's that's, that's where. Thank you, Subroto. Um, I was just about to say this, that it's a very unique panel. And uh, rather than me talking to them, I will just uh, throw the house open, but for a very, very limited time. Uh, yes, sir, General Cardozo, sir, you, you want to say something. This is, this is just a one-minute intervention. Uh, so, sir, uh, Maktani is here. The correspondents are here. I would like to say, comment upon what Sir Maktali said, what you said, what everybody in the panel has said. Uh, when we went into Sidhar, uh, we didn't have food, we didn't have water, we didn't have ammunition, we were short of ammunition, we didn't have blanket. But we had one thing, we had one single transistor. And that transistor helped us to understand that this is what the BBC said. That is the brigade of Kurkas which is that with Sunet, a very credible organization which made a very uh, fortuitous mistake, which helped the 4th Battalion, the 5th Kurkas Rifles, to turn the tables on a force which was 20 times our strength. It's, all this happened 50 years ago, but it's never too late to thank Sir Mark Tully and the BBC for the mistake they made 50 years ago. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Brigadier Murthy, sir, you have a, a question, I suppose. During the war, I was carrying a small transistor with me. During the Seventy One War, I was RMO with one of the infantry battalions, which happens to be yeah. Pandu. Um, sir, uh, you have to hold your mic closer to. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not used to. Sorry, I'm not used to. <laughs> Thank you, sir. During the Seventy One War, I was posted as an RMO with an infantry battalion. That is 22nd Maratha Light Infantry, Judge Pandu's Battalion. I was we were in Battle of Hilly. We entered Bangladesh through Hilly, part of 20 Mountain Division. I was carrying my small national tran transistor with me, and myself and my bunker mate, Major Indra Sharma, we used to, at later time, we used to listen to news. The, First station we used to always try used to be BBC. And the BBC used to unbiased most of the time they used to say as per Indian media the report is like this and as per Pakistani media the report is like this rather than making it something from so the so, so there was a disclaimer in whatever they informed you about that this is what they know and you yeah. can you can you Indian can make media your has given this them. news and. As for Pakistani yes. media, it is like this. Thank you. And as far as Pakistani media is concerned, I am talking of 12th of December. We were involved in Battle of Hili from 23rd of November till 10th of December. 11th December, Hili fell vacant. We crossed across Hili, we crossed Maheshpur Heart, and night halt, we stopped at Maheshpur Heart and switched on the transistor. 
Pakistani media is saying that tremendous event is going on at Delhi and Hindustan ki fawad khalaq ho rahi hai aur zabardas ladai chal rahi hai. We are already 10 kilometers inside Delhi. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, as uh, on all the television channels, they have a hard stop. So I suppose that is for me. So I have exceeded a uh, little more than uh, what I was you know, given. Uh, thank you very much, Amar Kali, and thank you, Mishra. Thank, thank you very you much, Prasad, for a great perception of perception.